Open your Bible, if you will, to Romans chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 23 through 31, basically focused on verse 31. This is probably going to be our last um, message from this particular chapter as we move on. That could change, but I anticipate this being the last uh, of our messages. Begin reading with me at Romans chapter 3. And verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning is the topic establishing the law. Let us pray. Father, help us, we pray, as we... Uh, move through these difficult times as we try to put aside the distractions that they have already caused us this morning and are generally causing in our lives and help us to focus on this piece of truth that you have chosen to have revealed to us through your word help us to understand it so as to make appropriate application of it we depend upon you upon your spirit and upon your guidance for this in Jesus name amen If you'll recall, if you've been following, Paul has been laying an enormous foundation. All alike, Jews and Gentiles, he said, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They have then, because of that, all of them lost any hope of being made right with God, which he calls here being justified. Because all they have as resources are the works of the law, and they have failed already to keep the works of the law. Let me make one small adjustment here, and hopefully that will help. Whether we're talking about the law given through Moses or the law of God written in the conscience of the Gentiles, they have broken God's law. They are unable to keep it. And because of that, they are ruined. All who are made right or justified before God are justified freely, Paul says, through his enablement. He used the word grace, but that's what he means. And this enablement that he gives through Christ is through his work. His death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, Here it's called his propitiation because that work of Christ, among other things, settled the debt of our sins before God. Propitiation, again, we talked about it last week, how that Paul used a sort of shorthand. He would use one term that is a piece of the whole picture of our redemption. He would use one term and have it represent the whole of the work of Christ. And then we looked at last week that since this work is all of God, through grace and mercy, there is no room for boasting. And in the process, verses 27 and 28, he drew two contrasts. He drew a contrast between two different theories of justification. One, justification based on the law, which he said is impossible, and the other, the law of faith, which is the only other alternative. We looked last week at those two principles or systems of becoming right with God, 
and determined that the system of law is indeed impossible. So, since Paul has eliminated the law as a valid system of justification, we can guess that he was probably hearing some feedback from some of the Jews complaining about the theology that he was putting forward, claiming that since he was saying this, that he was making the law void or useless. He was discounting it altogether, which is, leads to why he asked the question, does this then make the law void? Does it make it invalid? And of course he denies that, and so we're going to have to look at some things here to understand exactly what he's saying. Actually concerning the law, which is generally thought about, as being the law of Moses, although he makes the point in chapter 2 that even the Gentiles show by their conscience that they recognize and understand enough of the law of God to make them guilty before God. But concerning this issue of the law, Christianity has faced two enormous errors over the centuries. First of all is the error of those who would give too much importance to the law as it was given to the Jews. And then there are those who would minimize it too much. There are two ditches that, into which people have fallen in trying to understand this whole concept of being made right with God. In those who give too much emphasis, we generally find those who want to bring things that we recognize as being exclusively Jewish into Christianity. And Paul will make some comments about that all through the book. He'll get into it in more detail in chapter 14. But holy days and the diet and festivals and even those like those that false teachers at Galatia wanted to bring circumcision in to Christianity and make it necessary to be right with God. Some of these people we might say most, get very legalistic concerning the Sabbath. Certain groups have decided that we must keep Saturday as a special day of worship and service to God. Others want to say, no, it's Sunday, but there are special rules you have to follow. And each different group has their own set of different rules. But what they're doing is they're bringing things out of Judaism, this special day, this Sabbath idea into Christianity and applying it in a wrong way. And some of these people are so dead set in their thinking, they actually think that those who disagree with them or think differently are probably unconverted. There are many different versions of this line of thought, but they all have one thing in common. They handle the issue of Jewish law differently than Paul did. And they put emphasis on things and certain elements of it that he never did. In fact, since we're talking about law, I would like to give you uh, a rundown on Paul's innermost thoughts in regard to the Jewish law. Turn your Bible, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want to point you to a passage of Scripture that uh, very seldom does anyone ever reference and none of these people that are trying to bring Judaism into Christianity, they never reference this particular passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to read, uh, I think there's just 18 verses in it, so I'm going to read it all. And then we'll back up and comment on some of it. He said, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation to you? From you, for ye are our ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the Living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. <clears throat> and such trust we have through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. But our sufficiency is of God, who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. 
But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which, was, which is done away was glorious, how much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have much hope, we, have, we use great plainness of speech, not as Moses which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But, if their, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I want you to see some things here, and they're very important, because they establish Paul's theology, Paul's doctrine, Paul's attitude toward the Jewish law. In verse 6, if you'll look back, he contrasted the new covenant with the old covenant, and he represented the old covenant as being those ten words, written in tables of stone, those, not of the letter, he says, but of the spirit. The letter killeth. The law kills. The spirit gives life. What he's referring to here is that any violation of the Ten Commandments, that which was written on the stone, was punishable by death. And the reality is that every person has broken at least one of those Ten Commandments and thus is subject to that death. I've really labored over time to understand why people are so fascinated with a document that is their death warrant. <laughs> And the Ten Commandments is your death warrant. You have violated, on more than one occasion, at least one of those commandments. And the penalty for violation is death. Not just death here, but death eternally. Separation from God. Rejection by Him. Paul talked about his own experience interacting with the law at one point. Uh, keep your place here in, in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 3. Keep, keep your place there and turn back to Romans chapter 7 and verse 9. Paul makes this comment. He's talking about himself. He says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. In verse 7, he calls, back to 2 Corinthians now, in chapter 3 and verse 7, he calls the law the ministry of death. And he made sure... Uh, okay, wrong way, all right. Debbie, I'm hearing you guys talk, just so you know. <clears throat> In verse 7, he called it the ministry of death and made sure that we understand that what he was talking about was that which was engraven and written on the stones. Can, can, can you process that? He's looking at it in his mind's eye those tables of stone that sat for such a long time in the Ark of the Covenant. That was the basis of the law of the Jews. It was the basis of all of this, all of this discussion about keeping the law, about being justified, 
He calls it the ministry of death. In verse 18, verse 8, he affirms that the ministry of the Spirit, which if you read the whole thing, you realize it's also what he's calling the new covenant, is more glorious than that old ministry, that ministry of death. In verse 9, he calls the law the ministry of condemnation. Why do you stand accused of sin before God? Because of those tables of stone and what's written on them. Because of that covenant they represent. And then he makes a, a marvelous point in verse 10. The glory of the new covenant so far outshines the glory of the old covenant that it is as if it had no glory at all. It shines it into oblivion. By comparison, that old covenant, the glory of it is darkness. By comparison to the great glory of the new covenant. And then in verse 11, look at, look at this. If that which is done away was glorious, what is he talking about? He's only been talking about two things. He's been talking about the new covenant and he's been talking about the tables of stone. And here he says, if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. That's radical. And that is radical for a Jew. In some places, that's radical for a Christian to say. Now, there's places where I've started fights just by reading what is here. It's radical. And so we should not be surprised that the Jews of Paul's day saw him as turning away from completely the law and abolishing it. That's, you know, that was the question he asked, right? In verse 31, do we make void the law? That's what he was being accused of. It's also difficult to read this passage honestly and see how people get some of the things they affirm about the law and its place in Christian life. How could one look at all of these negative statements and still think that the law has any part of our right standing with God? So that's one group. There's another group. There are those who go in the opposite direction. They say there is no need to pay any attention to the law at all. <laughs> that we're all on our own to follow our own sense of moral direction. Some call it living by the law of love. But in reality, these people are simply living by codes of conduct they've invented for themselves. And among these, we find the modern so-called Christians who accept immorality and homosexuality and female preachers and all the other ungodliness that passes for what is called the Christian church in our day. Now, to be honest, there have been groups like this all through the history of Christianity, but they've never been in the majority as they are today. Orthodox Christianity has historically known these groups by the name antinomian, meaning they are against law. And, and by the way, when you get to know them, you realize they're not just against Moses' law, they're against all law except what they've, the law they've invented for themselves for you to live by. Just, just say it. Both of these groups are in error. The reality is we are not justified, we are not made right with God by keeping the Jewish law or any law. There is no law that exists which can eradicate the guilt and the debt of our past violations of God's law. Paul wrote this in Galatians 3 and 21, where he was having a discussion of this same order with uh, some Christians who had been deceived. Galatians 3, 21 is the law against the promises of God. God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So there's a couple of reasons why 
Righteousness cannot be by the law. Justification cannot be by the law. Because, first of all, it's impossible for there to be a law that gives life. And second of all, law can never do anything about your guilt. It's impossible. Now here's another reality. God has laws which are important for every believer to keep and consistent violations of them reveal that one is an, is an imposter, not a true believer. And just to make it confusing for us, some of those laws are identical to the ones that came through Moses. But they're given through and by the authority of Jesus Christ. And in, in the context of a completely different covenant. Let me show you. Turn your Bible, if you will, to Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Here we have the Apostle Paul writing still to the Roman church, still to this group of people where there are some on both ends, in, in both ditches, that are confused about the place of the law in the life of the believer. And then after saying everything that he said, he says this, Romans 13, 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this, state, this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. It is serious law. And habitual violators of it are revealed to be fraudulent and not children of God at all. John wrote in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he that is God is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Understand that when John is talking about committing sin here, He's already acknowledged that we sin. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, he says. He's talking about the practice of sin. He's talking about living in the continual habit of sin. And so I'm sure what is circulating around in your mind by now is this is confusing. I don't understand. I'm going to try to help. To understand this, though, understand this. If you're not willing to think carefully and accept what the scriptures teach as truth, you will forever remain confused. That's just the way it is. Further understand, neither your opinion nor the opinions of others have any weight here. We are relying completely upon the Word of God. So let's go back and sort of refresh ourselves as to where we are. Let's go back to Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 and this great foundation that Paul has already laid. Romans 3 and 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. 
whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now listen to what he says. Now we know that whatsoever, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Understand this. Right there after in your Bible, if you got the King James, law and the colon, there's the word that. And, and as Paul wrote it, those who read him understood that he's saying to the purpose that. The law has spoken to the world to the purpose that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty. Because understanding that is going to go a long ways toward helping you to understand the conclusions that we come to. We are all sinners habitual violators of God's law and he's given law to mankind in general again through through Moses the Jews were given the law of Moses but through the conscience the Gentiles have also been given law in chapter 2 and verse 14 of Romans he said this for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So again, any hope of being justified before God by keeping his law is ruined. Our record of guilt will remain forever and our debt that we have incurred thus far will remain unpaid so long as we undertake to be made right with God by the keeping of his law. Even if we were to begin now and flawlessly keep the law of God until our death, all hope of being justified by keeping the law is ruined. We've already seen from Galatians 3 and 1 that the law was not given for the purpose of giving life. That was not the reason for it. Paul has, Paul has said it was given to shut every mouth to establish the whole world as guilty before him. And immediately after Paul wrote what he wrote in Galatians 3 and 21, he wrote this, Galatians 3, 22. The scripture hath concluded all under sin to the purpose that, for the reason that, for the goal of the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, and listen to this very carefully, and please undertake to grasp what he's saying. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we, to the purpose that we might be justified by faith. And after faith has come, we're no longer under schoolmaster how is the law our schoolmaster what does it teach us well he's already said it very plainly it teaches us that we are hopeless sinners that we are under eternal judgment that we are totally helpless and in need of someone to save us that's its function that's its function. That's why it is here. It was never given to give life. It was never given to justify us. It was given to strip us of all hope of being justified outside of the grace and mercy of God. <coughs> so you might ask, how does it lead us to Christ? Well, there's a couple of different ways 
that things get led. Some animals, you can just kind of take them by, uh, just kind of walk out in front of them and start going in a direction and they'll follow in behind you. That's what shepherds relied on a whole lot with sheep. But then there are cantankerous animals and they need to be herded. They need for a group of dogs to run around and bark at them and nip at their heels and push them in a direction. That's the law. That's the law. The law prepares the groundwork for our salvation. It strips bare all of our excuses and all of our false hopes. And it reveals that we are sinners without hope. Sinners who need someone else to help them. And then it points out to us that there's only one reasonable and viable option. And that is one who has kept all of the law of God. He's the only one. History cannot find another. Paul wrote this in 1 Timothy 2 and 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Law hems us up, and it only gives us one gate to go through, and that is the gate of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you look at anybody else who purports to be a Savior, you will find him flawed by the same law by which you have been condemned. He also is condemned, and he is condemned, and he is condemned, and him. There's only one that's not condemned by the law of God, and that's the one who kept it perfectly. And that's the gate through which the law of God is designed to herd you. It is your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. Now, once we've got that settled in our minds, we go back to our text that we're actually looking at, uh, Romans 3 and 31, and you see another statement that Paul makes there that on the face of it is a little bit confusing, our understanding a little bit dim. It says, do we make void the law? He says, may it never be so, God forbid. And then he says, we establish the law. Wait a minute. I thought it was done away. I thought it was past. I thought the glory of it was disappeared, turned into darkness by the glory uh, of the new covenant. All that's true too. So how do we establish the law? How do you establish anything? That's an interesting question. We don't destroy it, he said. We don't make it void. We establish the law by means of, through, and he uses the words, the faith. Not just faith, the faith. It's what appears in the, in the original. And we pointed out last week, this term, the faith, doesn't mean my faith or your faith or all of our faith together as far as what we believe. It means this system of faith, this whole message of the gospel, which is often called the faith. It means that all this information we have about God, about ourselves, about our sins, about the great work of His Son, Jesus Christ, and all that is accomplished through it, that is the faith. And Paul says, through this, the faith, we establish the law. Now, there's no doubt that the Jews who heard him were thinking he was abolishing it, that he was doing away with it, that he was casting it aside, that he was finding no use and no profit for it. But he denies that. He denies that. The fact that it cannot justify us does not mean that it is not useful. It is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It just can't justify us. It just can't give us life. It can't do anything about our guilt. All it can do is remind us over and over and over again that we've failed. Let's think about this idea of establish. To establish something. 
in the, when, when thought about in this way, is to set it in its right place and use it properly. Let me give you, since I'm a mechanic, let me give you an illustration from the automobile world. A Toyota Camry is a good car. It's a really good car. It can carry a person thousands and ten thousands of miles in comfort and safety. It's a great car. But you should not use a Toyota Camry to tow a 30-foot camper. You shouldn't do that. It's not designed to do that. You will tear it up very quickly trying to do that. Maybe before you get out of the driveway. That will destroy it, not establish it in the way Paul is thinking. In Paul's mind, the law is good when used for its purpose, which is to shut every mouth and affirm that the whole world is guilty before God. Just don't use it to try to justify anybody. It's not designed for that. It won't work for that. It's not sufficient. It has no power. It is not established when it's used for the wrong end. And that's what the Jews were doing. They were using it for the wrong end. And Paul was saying, you're using it for the wrong end. And they're saying, you're trying to abolish it. He said, no, I'm not. Just trying to use it in the right way. Just trying to use it for what it was designed for. Some of the old Puritan divines were quite adamant that the sinner must have the law preached to him to prepare him to come to Christ. And they may have gone a little too far. Some of them were quite, quite extreme about it. But it's for certain that most today don't go far, nearly far enough. The faith and that old gospel that we preach plainly declare not only the guilt but the helplessness of the sinner and his total inability to save himself by anything that he does. Which means that this, the faith, this whole message, this whole work of justification and salvation and redemption and the pardon for guilt must come through the actions of God and not the actions of the sinner. You remember what Paul wrote. How many times have we read this passage? For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's exactly what Paul's just been talking about. It removes boasting. You didn't do it. You didn't do it. You see, it's not merely guilt that drives the sinner to Christ. There's a whole world full of people out there that know they're guilty. It is guilt together with an understood helplessness. That's what drives us through that gate of Christ. There's nowhere else to go. I can't fix this. No one else can fix this. Only Christ can fix this. I'm not only guilty, I am helpless in my guilt. I have to have a savior. I have to have someone who has proven himself to be the son of God. Only he can redeem me. Only he can save me. There's a verse to the hymn Rock of Ages. It doesn't appear in our hymnal, but I remembered it as I was putting this together and I went and found it. And here's what it says. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. How does a person get in that place? The law of God. The law of God has herded him into that corner where he has no hope but Christ. He feels and sees his guilt and he finally 
turns, lo turns loose of that last shred of pride and admits his helplessness and cries out, wash me, Savior, or I die. That's how he got there. That's how he got there. There's no way to go, friend, but to Christ. You have no other option than him. Let's look at it in a little different way. If you are outside of Christ, you are under a law system which demands perfection from you and will have no mercy on you. That system doesn't have any mercy built in. And it contains the very oath of the living God. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And that death is a physical death here and an everlasting death once you reach eternity and there is no escape. But there is a remedy now. God has sent his son to bear your sins in his own body on the cross so that you not only can be forgiven of all your sins, spared the penalty and judgment for them, but then granted the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the record of his perfect obedience credited to your account before God. Or as Paul wrote it, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There's your remedy. His instructions to you are to repent of your sins and trust him as your only hope. And by the way, this is the way the law is established in and through the faith. It is put in its proper place and it's used for the purpose for which it was given and intended. Do we make void the law? Paul said, may it never be so. We establish the law. So if you're a child of God, I hope you've been helped by understanding some of these things, maybe hopefully answering some of your questions. And if you're not yet in Christ, I hope this has helped to point you in his direction. The law is not something to be thrown away. Something is very useful. If you use it rightly, if you allow the Lord, the Holy Spirit to use it rightly in your mind, it will herd you into that corner where the only gate out is the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work. It'll strip you of all other hope. You say, that doesn't sound very nice. All of those hopes that it would strip you of are false. They won't save. They won't help. Doesn't do you any good to carry around counterfeit money. It's not going to help. It's not going to buy you anything. The law was given, and brutal as it is, it was given to pry our fingers off of hope in ourselves so that we would hope fully in Christ. And I pray this has helped you in some way to see that. Let us pray. Father, I know I butchered portions of this, and I ask you to forgive me for that. I pray that some measure of understanding may have leaked through and some soul may have come to see that you are the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Savior, that they would give up all hope in themselves. And Lord, if they're not yet there at that place, I ask you to continue to press them by your law into that place where they hope fully in Christ. And Lord, if there be any of your children that are partially or wholly confused about this thing of the law and how it relates to us, I pray that you would use it to help them with their understanding and cause them the more to glory in that marvelous means by which you brought them to salvation. Lord, we have been asked to pray for our country, and I do pray for our country. But Lord, I'm not praying for this newest virus that's the fascination of so many. 
Lord, I pray for this awful disease of ungodliness and rebellion that has infested our country. Even into what is called Christianity, I pray you would send your spirit and power upon us and deliver us from it and heal us of our misery. Renew, awaken, and revive your church, I pray, wherever it exists. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. And those of you listening by phone, I'm about to disconnect. I hope it worked out. <laughs>